Michael Mann. He is uh, uh, one of the world's top climate scientists. Uh, just absolutely brilliant guy. And, and uh, whoop, hang on just a second. The distinguished professor of meteorology and the director of the Earth System Science Center at Penn State University, a member of the National Academy of Sciences and recipient of the Tyler Prize, author of several books, including his most recent, The New Climate War, which is absolutely brilliant. And I want to get him back one of these days soon just to do a really deep dive on that book. Michael Mann with two N's dot net is his website. And you can tweet him at Michael E. Mann, M-A-N-N. And uh, uh, Michael, or Dr. Mann, welcome back to the program. It's, it's so good to have you. And thanks for, for hanging out with us for, for a full half hour and doing a deep dive on some of these issues here. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Tom. It's always a pleasure to be with you. Great. So let's let's uh, uh, let's see where to start. Uh, <laughs> let, let's start with tipping points. I, I, the, one of the uh, I, I believe it was George Monbiot wrote a piece about this a couple of weeks ago in The Guardian, suggesting that when you look at what seem to be stable systems, like if you spin a top on a on a on a, t on a table, you know, the little toy, the the it'll spin and it'll look like it's stable for a little bit and then it'll start to wobble and then all of a sudden it'll fall over and that wobble is an indication that it has hit the tipping point where the momentum of the spin can no longer sustain the the vertical you know resistance to gravity and that 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 dynamic of uh, instability hearkening tipping points is uh, you know, holds true uh, across all kinds of systems, from biological systems, uh, illnesses, uh, to geologic systems, to, you know, the, the spaceships, I mean, you know, just name it. And was raising this concern that we're seeing climate instability that, that seems unprecedented, and might that augur uh, that we're closer to tipping points than we think? Well, what, I, I realize I just threw a lot at you right there, but we've got a lot of time for this conversation. So uh, your thoughts, sir? Yeah, sure. Let's unpack that a little bit. Um, <clears throat> you know, there are tipping elements within the climate system. The average temperature of the Earth, uh, we don't foresee that going through a tipping point. The more carbon we burn and put into the atmosphere, the more the planet warms up. And the climate models have done an excellent job in capturing that warming, predicting that warming. But there are other components, other things that are set in motion as a result of that warming that do contain what we sometimes call nonlinearities, that do contain threshold-like behavior, where if you push them to, up to a certain point, they sort of continue to stay with you, but then you push it a little bit more and off down the hill it goes. It's like a boulder that you push up the side of a mountain um, once it gets to the top of the mountain, all it takes is that one extra push, and it's going to go all the way down the mountain. Uh, another analogy I like to use is a cliff. Um, when you go off a cliff, it's not going to help you uh, to have somebody take you back to the top of the cliff. You're done mm -hmm. when, when, once you've gone off the cliff. And so we do fear that there are some tipping elements within the climate system. Uh, the temperature of the planet that seems to be a smooth quantity that increases as we increase the carbon pollution. The amount of sea ice in the Arctic, um, the good news there is while it's diminishing dramatically, and that's a real problem, if we stop the warming, uh, and in fact, if we were able to cool the planet back down, the sea ice would come back. It doesn't go through a tipping point. Here's the bad news. The ice sheets, the Greenland ice sheet, the West Antarctic ice sheet, there are all sorts of mechanisms that govern the behavior of those ice sheets that exhibit that nonlinear behavior, that threshold-like behavior. Once you destabilize the ice shelves that are propping up parts of the West Antarctic ice sheet, then the ice starts to surge out into the ocean, and it becomes essentially unstoppable on the timescales that are relevant. Once that process is underway, you can't stop it. Even if you could cool the planet back down, it wouldn't stop. You set it in motion, and it sort of takes on a life of its own. So the collapse of the ice sheets is an example of a tipping point. We don't know how far we are at this point from warming the planet enough where we guarantee the, the collapse of large parts of the West Antarctic ice sheet, the part of the Antarctic ice sheet that's near sea level and can contribute readily to, to sea level rise, or the Greenland ice sheet. There's enough ice that could potentially collapse in those two ice sheets to give us 10 meters of sea level rise, 11 meters, 30 or, or more feet of sea level rise. How close we are to the point where we trigger 
uh, unstoppable collapse of those ice sheets? We don't know. And it's the best argument for not moving any forward. We are like the, the blindfolded uh, person who's approaching the edge of a cliff. The only sensible thing to do is to stop walking forward because you don't know how close you are to the cliff. And that applies here. Yeah, that's a great metaphor. Um, so what is what is the actual state of the Greenland ice sh shelf or sh uh, ice, whatever you call it, and and the, the shelf, the, the ice in Antarctica? Where, where are we? I, I saw a, a, a photo, actually, that kind of went viral maybe two weeks ago of the of one of the big ice sheets in Greenland that was blue instead of white and you know indicating that this is like there's a massive amount of meltwater here and we need to be concerned about this. Yeah, it was raining at the summit of Greenland a, a few weeks ago. We've never seen that before. It shouldn't be raining uh, up there at the highest elevation, the sort of center of the Greenland ice sheet, uh, one of the coldest parts of that ice sheet. And so that's a wake up call that we are seeing uh, melting at the surface of the Greenland ice sheet. Back in 2012, for the first time on record, the satellites were able to measure melting at the surface of the Greenland ice sheet over the entire ice sheet, all the way up to the, the summit in, in North Greenland. And what that means is that the process of melting is underway. It doesn't mean that uh, you know the, the ice sheet has melted, but that we're starting to see the process of melting, which we call ablation, outpace what we call accumulation. There's been a long-term sort of balance when it comes to these ice sheets between the amount of snow that accumulates um, and the amount of melting at the periphery of the ice sheet. And, and that balance keeps the ice sheet in sort of a stable configuration. What we've done now is we've tipped the balance. There's more melting uh, taking place. Um, there isn't uh, nearly enough accumulation to make up for that. And so we're measuring the, the loss of ice from the Greenland ice sheet, in fact, uh, in July of two years ago, July, I believe it was 2019, in one month, in, 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 in just that one month of July, there was enough melt from the Greenland ice sheet to raise global sea, level, uh, sea levels by a measurable amount, by a visually measurable amount, about a half a centimeter. If you were looking very carefully, you could actually see that rise. And that tells us that we are now seeing the, the, the beginning of that process of collapse of these ice sheets and decades ahead of schedule. Uh, the critics love to cite uncertainty, but the uncertainties have not broken in our favor. They've broken against us as we learn more, as we put more of these processes into the climate models, as we see what's happening in the real world, we are becoming aware that some of these impacts are indeed playing out faster than we predicted. And that's not good news. And I know we've, we've discussed this before, but I think it, it bears revisiting. Uh, there's not that's not the only consequence rising sea levels and and you know for people like you know we live here in Portland and most of Portland is um, you know probably not more than 30 or 40 feet above the Columbia River and in the, in the Columbia River just you know 100 miles down the road it's the Pacific Ocean if the oceans go up the river goes up I'm assuming and we're in trouble I mean there's just all over the country there's going to be people who are in trouble from that. But, but that rising sea level isn't the only consequence. There are also ocean currents that affect our weather, our weather patterns. Can you talk to, speak to that? But, yeah, I think you, you framed this, um, you know, uh, adroitly here because the fact that the Greenland uh, ice sheet is losing ice sooner than we expected means there's more fresh water that's being dumped into the North Atlantic as that ice melts and, and flows into uh, the North Atlantic Ocean. That fresh water, that, that fresh water is, light, is uh, lighter than uh, the salty waters that you typically find at those latitudes. And so that decreases the density of the waters at the surface. And that inhibits the sinking motion, which is driven by those dense, cold, salty waters. So you make the surface of the ocean there fresher you inhibit the sinking motion that drives the so-called ocean conveyor, the great ocean conveyor, this warm current that we sometimes equate with the Gulf Stream, but it's really a larger current that actually continues on north into the North Atlantic, heading towards uh, Iceland and warms uh, parts of Europe, warms uh, parts of Greenland, warms uh, parts of uh, eastern Canada, the coastal eastern Canada, maritime regions of North America. 
And so that current system plays a very important role in those regional climates. And if you collapse that current system, then you can have a, a pretty dramatic impact on those regional plants, uh, those regional climates. Now, you won't get another ice age like the movie The Day After Tomorrow. That movie was a caricature of the science. Uh, but what you would do is uh, decrease the mixing of ocean waters in the North Atlantic, which is one of our most productive uh, uh, regions in the world when it comes to biological productivity, when it comes to fish populations uh, upon which we rely. Uh, for 25% uh, of uh, the world gets its, as its main source of protein um, fish, and those uh, fish populations uh, would be negatively impacted in one of the most vital natural fisheries in the world. There's a, something else that comes into it, and it has to do with some pretty technical physics of how ocean currents work, but as that ocean current slows down or collapses, the sea level in the North Atlantic will actually change in response to that, and sea levels will come up along the east coast of the U.S. even more than we would expect, so you get extra sea level rise along the east coast of the U.S. Dr. Mann, uh, I wanted to talk to you about kids and despair. This, this uh, troubles me, and I I confess, you know, I, I have been at various times uh, rather hysterical about the climate emergency and, and, and uh, uh, you know, oh my God, you know, we could trigger the new Permian extinction and all this kind of stuff. Um, and what's happening, it appears, is that as many as, oh, well, there's the latest study, 56% of people between 16 and 25 years old are actually immobilized in some ways in their lives by fear of the climate future. And as a result, a lot of people are just saying, screw it, they're becoming climate nihilists. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not gonna, you know, I'm not gonna protect, which is of course exactly what the fossil fuel companies want. You know, like, oh, we're past all the tipping points, there's nothing we can do. Um, speak to those folks, if you could, please. Yeah, thanks, Tom. It's really important. It, it is one of the uh, main points in my book, in The New Climate War, is that the danger um, of uh, sort of uh, defeatism and uh, despair now that denial itself is on the way, because we can all see the impacts of climate change. So the fossil fuel interest, the polluters know they can't get away with trying to convince us that climate change isn't happening, but they've turned to a whole new array of uh, tactics in their effort to keep us from moving on, from moving away from fossil fuels, moving toward renewable energy, clean energy. And so one of the tactics, in fact, is to sort of foment uh, doom mongering and despair mongering, because if we truly believe it's too late to do anything about the problem, it potentially leads to disengagement, just the opposite of what we need. And it's understandable. Um, we are you know, we face this barrage of bad news in our news cycle today, uh, much of it related to the damaging impacts of climate change these days with the devastating extreme weather events that we're seeing play out in real time. It's easy to be overwhelmed by that, and it's easy to fall victim to the sort of doom and despair and this idea that there's nothing we can do about the problem. But as you say, that plays right into the hands of the fossil fuel industry and the forces of inaction, the inactivists, as I call them in the book. And so what we need to do is to recognize that there's some people of goodwill, good intentions, good-hearted people who have fallen into despair, who have fallen victim uh, to some misinformation and disinformation. For example, the claim that runaway warming is underway and there's nothing that we can do to stop it. Um, there are, you know, prominent players in the climate space that continue to try to convince people of that. And it feeds this sense that it's too late uh, to prevent uh, catastrophic warming of the planet. But the science tells us it's not. The science tells us there is huge urgency. And we've been talking about that. We can see why it's urgent that we act now and we act dramatically. But there is agency. There is still time to prevent the worst impacts from playing out. And so when you encounter people, friends, family members who have fallen into despair, help them understand the reasons why it isn't too late. Um, and, you know, you can uh, follow me on Twitter, Michael E. Mann. I regularly post information here that I think would be helpful in those efforts. 
to show people the way forward, to help them out of this abyss so that they're back on the front lines demanding action. That's where we need them. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I think there was a point probably 20 years ago when a little bit of hysteria got attention and maybe uh, caused people to say, okay, we, we need to do something, but uh, th th too much of a, of a good thing, well, whatever. I'm, 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 I'm torturing metaphors here. 2100. It's a challenge for all of us, Tom. It's a challenge for all of us to find that right balance between, you know, uh, between um, indicating, conveying the urgency, but not implying that um, that we're beyond the point uh, of no return because yeah. we're not. Yeah, there you go. Uh, 2,180 scientists around the world have signed on to this worldwide declaration demanding a fossil fuel non-proliferation -prol treaty. Um, what are your thoughts in the, uh, I think we have about two and a half minutes here left. What are your thoughts about how how we get out of this? Where, where, are, the, where, 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 where are the low hanging fruit? Where are the pressure points that, that we can, you know, quickly make progress in moving in the right direction and, and, and start the process of maybe some of the longer term, more difficult challenges as well? Yeah, thanks. John. I, I was proud to be the lead uh, signatory uh, on, on that letter. Um, and uh, I think it is time for politicians, uh, for our elected representatives to act on our behalf rather than continuing to uh, be enablers of the fossil fuel industry. We cannot allow any additional fossil fuel infrastructure. Even the conservative International Energy Agency um, a, a month ago or so came out and said, if we are to prevent catastrophic warming of the planet, more than one in Celsius, three degree Fahrenheit warming of the planet, there can be no new fossil fuel infrastructure. And so it is time for us to demand that our politicians do not green, green light uh, additional line projects do not continue to provide subsidies uh, and other incentives to the fossil fuel industry and instead provide those subsidies and incentives to renewable energy and put a price on carbon and block new fossil fuel infrastructure. These are all things that need to happen. We can't do them ourselves. We need our politicians to do it and we need to elect politicians who will do it.